Welcome to all of you. Some of you here, but most of you online. Unfortunately, as you know, the COVID-19 measures are still in place. We've had a difficult year. And now, with the advent of the Omicron variant, things are not looking up yet. I really do feel for our students, who have been through so much already, and who will now be missing out on yet more campus activities. And of course, we miss them too. It also means we can't be celebrating this event quite as we would like. So you will be seeing a lot of me this afternoon. And what about me? Uh, so, so Prometheus, is that you? Yes, it is I, Prometheus. Wow, just wow. I'm so honored to meet you. You know, you are our hero, our mascot, our, our champion. That's how it should be. Remember what I did for you. I mean, I took the fire from Olympus and I gave it to humanity. Okay, I did it without asking and just a bit of a misunderstanding, but I was severely punished for it. I bear the scars to this day. So tell me, to what use have you put it, apart from putting it in your logo, that is? Oh, great things, great things. Um, you can see them all around you. We've built bridges, literally, and roads and skyscrapers. Technology is all over. And we've acquired knowledge and passed it on to the more than 100,000 engineers we have educated over the years. And they have gone out into the world and left their mark on it as innovators and as entrepreneurs. So that is our legacy, and we are very proud of it. Proud? Hmm, perhaps. Academically, you've done all right. But as human beings, look at the state of the world. Yes, yes. We are now seeing the downside of widespread industrialization. It has brought us prosperity and well-being, but over time it has also caused pollution, resource depletion, and of course the real big one, climate change. Yes, and on the subject of climate, droughts, heat waves, floods, even here in Delft, it seems you've lost that particular battle. It's true, we've lost the battle, but I'm hopeful we won't lose the war. We have learned some valuable lessons. One is that technology alone and by itself is not enough. We need all disciplines and all those involved, from hardcore engineers to psychologists to policymakers. And we've been making big strides with that recently. And the other? Sorry, what? You said one, so ah. what's the other? Ah, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, it is that if we do want a fair chance of limiting the effect of climate change, we have to speed up the energy transition for the next 180 days and beyond. So if you stick around today, you'll hear all about it. Sounds promising, my friend. I'll check in with you later to see if you can walk the walk as well as you talk the talk. So, get this show on the road. See you later, Prometheus. Prometheus gave fire to humankind, physical fire that allowed us to cook and to heat, to force and to smelt. He also gave us an inner fire, the drive to pursue knowledge and to understand the world around us. At TU Delft, we have embraced that inner fire to become a community where knowledge flows freely. We are committed to use that knowledge to make the world a better place. But we can't go it alone. We do it together with alumni, industry, authorities, in short, all those who share our commitment. Today, we honor three people who possess that same inner fire. People who have achieved exceptional results in science, business and society. We are proud that by awarding them an honorary doctorate, we can welcome them into our community. We now come to the stage in the proceedings at which three honorary doctorates will be conferred. To this end, I open the extraordinary public session of the Board for Doctorates 
to mark the celebration of the 180th anniversary of the foundation of our university. The Board for Doctorates of the Delft University of Technology, with the assent of the Executive Board, has this year decided to grant honorary doctorates to Jürgen Janek, Professor of Physical Chemistry at the Justus Liebig University in Germany, Jennifer Holmgren, CEO of the US carbon recycling company Lanzatech, and Frans Timmermans, Executive Vice President of the European Commission. Let's take a look at what honorary promoter Professor Marnix Wagemaker said in honor of Professor Jürgen Janek. I'm very really proud that Jürgen Janek is receiving this honorary doctorate um, because he, um, he's really one of the pioneers in, in the fundamental understanding of new battery technology like solid state. And this is the fundamental understanding we really need to make progress. Uh, and he recognized that very early on as, hey, this is a crucial field for, for energy transition, right? And, but at that time, it was early 90s, um, actually that field was a kind of dying out. And uh, I had exactly the same experience here. Especially now a, a new type of uh, battery system, uh, solid state batteries, has a lot of promise but a lot of challenges. Um, uh, to relate to that first, eh? so, so if we now look at elect electrical cars, we have the re what I would call the regular lithium-ion battery, uh, which is a liquid electrolyte, but that is also the aspect that makes it not ha have a, a certain safety risk because it's flammable and toxic. And solid-state batteries address this issue because the liquid electrolyte is replaced by a solid electrolyte, and hence the word solid-state battery because it's uh, all solid, it's almost like a, a rock, let's say, the, the battery. There's many, many challenges, and, and uh, what, the, uh, what Jürgen did is, is doing, uh, I must say, is just systematically addressing these challenges and uh, revealing yeah, the, the fundamental mechanisms that, yeah, let's say, uh, prohibit for now to, to achieve this, this type of battery. And at, at some stage, uh, even for an insider, it's almost impossible to see what is good and what is bad and uh, to, to make a good comparison. So what did Jürgen uh, with his group do? He, he did a, a review on well, what is now really the, 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 the current performance on the lab scale of a solid state battery and, and try to grasp all the details to make it really comparable and put that in graphs and then you get the real overview of let's say the status of the field. Jürgen is, it is a very approachable uh, person, his personality, uh, with a fantastic overview of the field. He's a very friendly person who uh, very noticeably enjoys um, uh, explaining. He really likes to uh, discuss uh, phenomena, uh, he's really interested and, and open also uh, not only towards colleagues but you also see that, that uh, attitude towards PhD students in his group. I'm really proud that the TU Delft uh, provides uh, Professor Janek uh, with his honorary doctorate because of his role in the, in the fastly growing field of solid state batteries. Um, and his role is really um, providing systematic understanding of the processes that really matter. And dear Jürgen, um, congratulations with this, this uh, honorary doctorate. I'm extremely happy and proud of, for, of you and, and happy that I'm uh, able to be part of it. Um, and yeah, I, I truly think you, you deserve this based on, on the meaning uh, you, you provide to the field of solid state batteries. And I hope uh, for many interesting discussions in the future. Dear Rector Magnificus, dear Professor Jürgen Janek, ladies and gentlemen, dear Jürgen, it's, it's my great pleasure to welcome you in Delft um, for this event in, in light of your important research uh, um, in the context of the energy transition. The Board of Doctorates uh, of this university has decided to award the title of Honorary Doctor uh, for your fundamental work on uh, solid-state electrochemistry and for spreading 
um, or, or, or global leadership in spreading the knowledge and experience uh, thereof. Um, and have granted you all the rights uh, which, by law of co uh, and custom, are vested in the doctorate. I most willingly accept the task assigned to me by the Rector Magnificus of the Delft University of Technology, and by virtue of the authority conferred on us by law, and in accordance with the decision of the Rector, I hereby confer upon you, Jürgen Janek, the degree Doctor Honoris Causa, and grant you all the uh, rights pertaining de reto by law and custom. In evidence hereof, you will be presented with the degree certificate uh, signed by the rector and confirmed by, uh, with the great seal of the university. As a token of the dignity thus conferred upon you, uh, I will uh, virtually drape the kappa over your shoulders. Um, having thus fulfilled the task assigned to me, um, I have the honor of being the first to address you as doctor uh, of the TU Delft uh, and to congratulate you with the dignity conferred on you. Thank you very much, Professor Wagenmaker. And on behalf of Delft University of Technology, I congratulate you, Professor Jürgen Janek, with your honorary doctorate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Now let us watch Professor Henry Weary's laudation oh. from Jennifer Holmgren. Oh, sorry. Shall I say a few words of thanks? Or? Yes. That oh, was sorry, I, I didn't. Okay, please, okay. please yeah. uh, take your time. Yeah, thank you. Um, sehr geehrte Rektor Magnificus, Manix, hartlich bedankt für diese Unterscheidung. Ich fühle mich verehrt, von Dach, das Ehrendoktorat in Andrangst der Woche nehmen. Um, I apologize for my poor Dutch. Um, it was wonderful. It's in fact a great honor, and uh, I thank you very much. I also congratulate to Delft and you for the 180th anniversary. I think speeding up the energy transition is a great subject, and I'm happy to contribute to that. I'd like to thank, of course, my great team in Gießen and in Karlsruhe. It's a great privilege to work with them. I'm deeply impressed by the day today here at Delft and about the research going on for the future of our societies. And last but not least, thanks to my best friends for their continuous friendship with the boring physical chemist, Peter Limay and all the others. Thanks to Hilke and Philip for educating me a bit in Dutch. Thank you very Thank you very much for your kind words, Professor Janek, and welcome to our community. Now let us watch Professor Henry Wiery's laudation for Jennifer Holmgren. Jennifer, she's an extremely inspiring uh, woman and scientist. And she is really, she and her company, trying to change the world. Well, her uh, company, uh, Lancetec, was uh, founded some uh, 15, uh, 16 years ago. Right now, uh, approximately 250 uh, people are uh, working, offices at several places and active both in the US and in Asia. Yeah, we need alternative uh, fuels. Sust in uh, aviation, we call them uh, sustainable aviation fuels, and this is what she is working on. Yeah, I'm, I'm really proud that uh, Theo Delft is giving uh, Jennifer an honorary doctorate because of what she is doing. She started a new field. She is one of the front runners, I would say, there. And the way she is doing this, uh, the inspiring way and trying, uh, well, not only trying, but succeeding in, in making things happen, in this field and tackling this big issue, yeah, this is, uh, I, I would say, this is uh, fantastic. And it's an, an example, and a very inspiring example for, for everybody in our community. The, the energy transition is really a massive challenge. Eh? Right now, we get our energy quite easily. We uh, get it from uh, the ground, the fossil fuel. We have been used to that, we are addicted to it, but how do we replace it? And that is difficult, and it requires a lot of green energy, and you have to make sure that you use this green energy that we are getting more and more, 
that we use that in a very efficient way. And we need the best possible ways to transfer this in an energy carrier that we can store, for instance, on board of an aircraft. In an aircraft, weight is a big issue. And so therefore, we cannot use uh, batteries, at least not for the longer distance. Batteries are fine for a very short distance. But for the longer distance, we need a chemical. We need something like jet fuel, kerosene. And to make this in an uh, artificial way, in a very efficient way as well, this is what her company is, uh, is working on. Yeah, I think uh, uh, a very big added value of uh, Jennifer is that she put her field, so uh, biotechnology, in the spotlight of what the world currently needs. Uh, so, of course, she did a lot of things herself. Uh, so she, she has a, a PhD in this uh, field. Uh, she published uh, about it, uh, has about 50 patents. Uh, so, uh, but what is so good, it's, it's not just the scientific uh, value, but she is transferring this scientific knowledge in true innovation, in, in something that is being applied. And ultimately, this is what also fits so well to TU Delft. Uh, what science if you're not using it? What I also think is a very big contribution of what she is doing is how she is inspiring her people. If you look at her company and what her company is doing, the way that the people are actually uh, involved in everything related to sustainability, that really makes you happy. And I think this is a, is a, is a very inspiring example. And examples like this is what we need. Times during the past two years, the pandemic forced us to change our plans, which means that the next part will be fully online, where we actually have to make the connection to the Chicago area. And I'm so happy to see uh, Jennifer here. Jennifer, how are you doing? How is life over there? It's wonderful. It's cold, but wonderful. I'm, I'm so glad uh, I see you. I can talk to you. And I will be even more glad when you are going to visit us uh, in April. And at that time, we will have the opportunity to hand the degree certificate and the kappa to you in person. And I'm really looking forward to that. Dear Rector Magnificus, dear Dr. Jennifer Holmgren, ladies and gentlemen, the Board for Doctorates of this university has decided to award the title of honorary doctor to Jennifer Holmgren for her pioneering work on industrial biotechnology and her inspirational leadership focused on achieving a circular carbon economy and has granted her all the rights which by law or custom are vested in the doctorate. I most willingly accept the task assigned to me by the Rector Magnificus of the Delft University of Technology. By virtue of the authority conferred on us by law, and in accordance with the decision of the rector, I hereby confer upon you, Jennifer Rosa Holmgren, the degree of Doctor Honoris Causa, and grant you all the rights pertaining thereto by law and custom. In evidence hereof, you will be presented with the degree certificate signed by the rector and confirmed with the great seal of the university. As a token of the dignity this conferred upon you, I will virtually drape the kappa over your shoulders. Having thus fulfilled the task assigned to me, I have the honor of being the first to address you as a doctor of TU Delft and to congratulate you with the dignity conferred to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, uh, Rector Magnificus. Thank you, Professor Henry Werich, my promoter. I am humbled by your kind words. And thank you, colleagues, past and present. Humanity has faced so many challenges that seemed insurmountable. Yet we have come through. And while optimism and hope do not solve problems, 
when combined with science, technology, commitment, and perseverance, they do. TU Delft has a tremendous history of creating sustainable world by educating those that can lead technological transformations with compassion and through collaboration. And that is exactly what's required to ensure a sustainable and equitable future. It is deeply humbling to receive this honor and I'm grateful to be given the opportunity to stand next to all of you who are working to create a just energy transition and a better world for all. Thank you for welcoming me into the TU Delft family. Thank you very much, Jennifer Holmgren, for your kind words from the other side of the ocean. It was wonderful that you, you could be with us this afternoon. On behalf of Delft University of uh, Technology, I congratulate you with your honorary uh, doctorate. Thank you very much and see you soon in Delft. And thank you also, Professor Weary. And finally, let us watch Professor Herder's words in praise of Frans Timmermans. Frans Timmermans is receiving an honorary doctorate today at TU Delft for his relentless efforts to put combating climate change on the European agenda. And not only putting it on the agenda, but writing a visionary policy document on it, Fit for 55. And he has garnered support for this Fit for 55 document from industry, from countries, from all kinds of stakeholders, including knowledge institutes. And that in itself, rallying so much support for a visionary document, deserves a honorary doctorate. A large part of the climate change that we have made as humans is due to our energy consumption. So part of the solution is also to go through an energy transition and move to non-fossil based energy production. So a large part of the solution in combating climate change is a thorough energy transition. So that's exactly in the DNA of TU Delft to look at these problems from a systems perspective. Not only from a technological perspective, but also look at governance, policy and economic issues. And it is our responsibility and also our role and moral duty to provide as many options as possible to policymakers so that they have a choice. I'm proud to be the honorary promoter for Frans Timmermans because he is an example of connecting different disciplines, connecting different stakeholders together in his visionary Fit for 55 document. Without this document, without his vision, without rallying support of all the nation states and industry behind this plan, the energy transition would be slower. So his part in speeding up the energy transition is really making sure that the entire Europe is behind plans and is making new plans to speed up this energy transition. And I'm proud to be his honorary promoter because I wish, I think we should all be so, let's say, connective as he is, building bridges among parties. I have always also tried to connect policy science to engineering science. So in that sense, he is, again, from a different angle, also doing more or less the same thing, connecting different disciplines, stakeholders together. What makes him uh, particularly special in this case is the way he has um, connected industry, knowledge institutes, um, public stakeholders, countries together behind one visionary document. And this document is not a, it's not a simple thing, it's a very ambitious document but with ambitious goals new policy statements, new instruments that will allow the EU to become, maybe we are already, but even to stay and become a climate change leader or combating climate change leader in the world. So this, this is his vision that makes him special. It's not just mitigating climate change, but it's also the vision to become the leader in the world in doing that. Dear Rector Magnificus, dear Mr. Frans Timmermans, ladies and gentlemen, the Board for Doctorates of this university has decided to award the title of Honorary Doctor for his tireless efforts in society to address the climate problem and to persuade governments 
businesses and institutions in Europe to take the necessary actions. And we have granted him all the rights which, by law or custom, are vested in this doctorate. I most willingly accept the task assigned to me by the Rector Magnificus of Delft University of Technology. And by virtue of the authority conferred on us by law and in accordance with the decision of the Rector, I hereby confer upon you Franciscus Cornelis Gerardus Maria Timmermans the degree of Doctor Honoris Causa and grant you all the rights pertaining thereto by law and custom. In evidence hereof, you will be presented virtually with the degree certificate, signed by the rector and confirmed with the great seal of our university. And as a token of this dignity, thus conferred upon you, I will also virtually drape the kappa over your shoulders. Having thus fulfilled the task assigned to me, I have the honor of being the first to address you as doctor of the TU Delft and to congratulate you with the dignity conferred on you. Congratulations. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Herder. And on behalf of Delft University of Technology, it's my honor to congratulate you, Frans Timmermans, with your honorary doctorate. Thank you very much, Rector Magnificus, Professor Herder. Um, it is truly, truly humbling uh, to hear the words spoken about me, and uh, it is a great honor to receive this honorary doctorate. I only wish my grandfather, who was born in Delft, and who spent his life mostly as a coal miner, could see that his grandson uh, uh, could achieve this uh, great honor. It is a tribute to what is possible in Dutch society. Um, but I have to add to this, this huge honor is bestowed on me personally, but it would never have been bestowed on me had I not had a wonderful team who work with me on the issues you mentioned, Professor Herder, a team led by Diederik Samson, who is an alumnus of this university, Absolutely. and a team that also has the support of more than 30,000 uh, people working in the European Commission who are all dedicated to the transition we will need to go through. So once again, thank you very much also on their behalf. Thank you very much, and we look forward to your lecture later on uh, in this program. Thank you. And herewith, I close this extraordinary public session of the Board for Doctorates. In 2022, we celebrate our 180th anniversary. To ensure our future as a university and a society, we have to keep our planet livable. Our energy system must become net zero by 2050 if we want to reduce the impact of climate change. This means we must change the way we produce, transport, store and consume energy. We have to use less energy as consumers and we have to make transport, buildings and industry more efficient. Overall, we will use a lot more electricity and we need to produce that from sources like solar and wind energy. We will still need new fuels like biofuels and hydrogen. We also need new sources of heat like geothermal and solar heat to heat our buildings and power our showers. All of this is expensive and calls for lots of new infrastructure. And we need to reform regulation and energy markets, as well as adjust our behavior. At TU Delft, we work on a lot of these things. New materials and technologies, policies and systems. We scale up our innovations and test them in our field labs and we bring people together to make the energy transition happen. But to get to net zero fast enough, we have to pull out all the stops. That is why this birthday, we want to highlight the need to speed up the energy transition. 
Will you join us in our efforts? Our ultimate goal, a clean, affordable, safe and reliable energy system for all. TU Delft, creating impact for a better society. Hey, Tim, looking at your campus, a lot has changed over the past 180 years or so. But tell me, what happened to my statue? I'm just a shadow of myself. Ah, Prometheus, what, what can I say? Times were hard and you were worth your weight in bronze. But uh, joking aside, you're right about the campus. A lot is happening, and I'm not just talking buildings here, but the whole community. We are creating an innovation ecosystem, a place for people to meet, not just students and scientists, but everybody who plays a part in innovation, like entrepreneurs from startups and companies. We invent, we experiment, we create and make sure that our ideas really come to something that benefits society. Much more than a university, we are now a true home of innovation. I'm impressed. It gets better. Talking of the energy transition, we even have a number of sustainability temples on campus, if I may call them that. You may. Tell me more. Last October, we opened our electrical sustainable power lab. Then there is the Green Village, our innovation field lab. Only this morning, we've opened our 24-7 energy lab there. It is our latest milestone in speeding up the energy transition. Marjan Krijns, director of the Green Village, can tell you all about this Tio Delft temple. De energietransitie is continu in het nieuws. Je leest erover in de krant, je hoort het voorbij komen op het acht uur journaal. Maar toch is de energietransitie iets van alle tijden. Op dit moment gaat het vooral om de omschakeling van fossiele brandstoffen naar duurzame energie. Een van de plekken waar de energietransitie heel tastbaar wordt zijn woonwijken. Er gaat namelijk geen dag voorbij zonder dat je ergens leest over wijken die van het gas af moeten. Of dat de toename van het gebruik van warmtepompen en de opwek door zonnepanelen zorgen voor problemen op het elektriciteitsnet. Op de Green Village zijn we daarom een uniek project gestart. Het 24-7 Energy Lab. Met 24-7 werken wij aan een lokaal, CO2-vrij energiesysteem. Het idee achter 24-7 is simpel. De gebouwde omgeving, denk daarbij aan woonhuizen, winkels, ziekenhuizen, maar ook kantoorgebouwen, is op dit moment goed voor 35% van de finale Nederlandse energievraag. Wanneer we erin slagen om die gedeeltelijk CO2-vrij te maken, zetten we een reuze stap in het versnellen van de energietransitie. Maar het gebruik van duurzame energie zorgt wel voor de nodige uitdagingen. Zo moeten vraag en aanbod altijd in balans zijn. Hernieuwbare energie immers zorgt voor grote schommelingen. S'nachts is er namelijk geen zon en kan het ook wel eens windstil zijn. Daarnaast vindt de meeste opwek van zonne-energie plaats in de zomer. Terwijl de piek van de energievraag van gebouwen juist in de winter ligt. Een van de mogelijke oplossingen is de aanleg van een seizoensbuffer. Om de overtollige opwek in de zomer op te slaan voor gebruik in de winter. Dat kan met een batterij, met de opslag van warmte in putten onder de grond maar ook in de vorm van waterstof. Bij ons, hier op de Green Village, staat een onopvallende container... die alle ingrediënten bevat voor opwekking, omzetting en opslag van CO2-arme elektriciteit. In principe werkt het systeem eenvoudig. Als er meer aanbod van zonne-energie is dan er gebruikt wordt wordt de rest energie overgeheveld naar een batterij. Die batterij wordt vooral gebruikt voor de dag-nachtopvang. Wordt er nog meer elektriciteit opgewekt en is de batterij vol... dan wordt de elektriciteit omgezet in waterstof en opgeslagen voor de winter. In de winter is er natuurlijk weinig aanbod van zonne-energie. Maar dan levert de brandstofcel zowel elektriciteit als warmte... uit het door jezelf opgeslagen waterstof. Ons 24-7 Energy Lab zal dus grote gevolgen hebben voor de organisatie van het toekomstige energiesysteem. En het mooie is, we gaan dit systeem echt bouwen. 
We gaan aantonen dat het kan. Zorgen dat er altijd voldoende energie is. Op een slimme en duurzame manier. Zonder dat de bewoners er hinder van ondervinden. En hier neemt de Green Village een unieke positie in. Er wonen nu namelijk 12 mensen. En hun ervaring is erg waardevol bij de ontwikkeling van een gebruiksvriendelijk systeem. En dat vind ik zo ongelooflijk mooi. We gaan hier namelijk heel erg veel van leren. But how about the campus itself? How green is that? I hear you, Prometheus. I, I hear you. Practice what you preach. It's true. We still have a way to go there. But we are really ambitious. We plan to be carbon neutral and circular by 2030. We've appointed a special sustainability coordinator. And he has drawn up an action plan that should get us there. We will all have to make an effort. But I am optimistic we'll succeed. Well, I could steal the wings of Hermes to help you speed it up a little bit, but all joking aside, uh, I will come by from time to time to see how you're going, because after all, this is my campus too. Wonderful. Thank you very much again, Prometheus. On our and your campus, we educate new generations as well as professionals in the field. We innovate. We come up with new solutions that can accelerate the energy transition. We demonstrate. We show in our field labs how these innovations can reach society. And we accelerate. Step by step, we intensify these efforts together with our partners. That last one is crucial. I've said it already, we cannot go it alone. Science, industry, politics, society, we all have to join forces to make the energy transition happen. It is our best chance of mitigating the impact of climate change, and that is without doubt the challenge of our times. So today, we have honored someone who plays a crucial role in the battle against climate change. I'm talking, of course, about Frans Timmermans, first vice president of the European Commission and responsible for the European Green Deal. It is his job to get the climate issue on the agenda of governments, businesses and institutions and to get the world to take the necessary actions. According to Politico, Politico Europe, that makes him one of this year's 28 most influential people in Europe. And last year he was on the Times list of the 100 most influential people in the world. You have already heard Pauline Herder tell us why we believe his contribution is worthy of an honorary doctorate. I'm very proud. Mr. Timmermans will now be sharing his view on climate and energy with us. Dear professors, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear students, you are going to forge the future. I want to say happy birthday to the university and of course congratulations to all of you. This great university was founded by one of my favorite kings, um, namely the Dutch King William II on the 8th of January 1842, so almost 180 years to a day. And it has grown into a leading technical university that is among the top 15 engineering and technology universities in the world. I think this is something you can be very proud of. Your open approach to the world, an approach of looking beyond the horizon and collaborating with the other Dutch technical universities and with sister universities around the world is, I think, truly inspiring. It is also an important example of the great power of imagination. Your motto, impact for a better society, put it, puts it exactly right. For we should not be naive. Whatever can be discovered 
will be discovered. And whatever can be done, will be done. But doing and not doing are ethical decisions. It is a moral imperative for scientists to always keep the human factor central to their work and exploration. It is a moral imperative for all of us to put our talents to service for a better society, to let us be led by the facts, to be guided by science. The EU and its member states have done so with regard to the climate crisis. They decided to no longer wait for others, but to take a big step forward by adopting the European Green Deal. This then is our new growth strategy, committing to climate neutrality in 2050 and increasing our climate ambition for 2030 by committing to cut emissions by at least 55% as compared to 1990. And we have presented in the Fit for 55 package a fundamental set of legislative proposals to put the policies in place that will get us there. We did this because science impels us and because the facts are stubborn things. The consequences of increased wildfires, droughts, floods, loss of nature, and the pollution of the air we breathe, the water we drink, and the soil we grow our food in are devastating. This is an existential challenge. We did this, we came up with the Green Deal, because citizens demand action to tackle the climate crisis, not just because science compels us to, our citizens now understand and want us to act. And this goes especially for the younger generations and especially the students at this university. I want to commend all those young people who look, who took the streets to the streets in the Fridays for Future movement, for with whom them, without them, I have to say, we would never have gotten the European Green Deal. Do not underestimate the power of your idealism, enthusiasm. Don't be modest, but organize yourselves. This is about your future. Of course, this debate cannot simply be project fear. The Green Deal is ultimately a project of hope and a positive proposition for a more sustainable and a more just economy that benefits all. Cleaner air, fresher water, food with less pesticides, more parks, greener cities, and energy efficient transportation and housing. And yes, it can be done, if only we can imagine it. I've seen firsthand that this university is bringing into, into this into practice. You are turning imagination into reality on a daily basis. Science is our most important ally, but science isn't absolute. It does not have all the answers. If anything, it is a method a constant and dogged search for better knowledge. We progress by weeding out bad theories and false assumptions. We find ourselves, however, living in times where some brazenly and shamelessly put forward alternative facts and peddle conspiracy theories, a time where rationalism is again challenged by obscurantism. Our democracy and freedoms are under threat from those who deliberately manipulate the fears and frustrations of ordinary citizens. Not so much to convince people of another ideology or particular truth, but to chain people to their fears and to confuse and disrupt society. Because in the bedlam of discord, they believe they have a better shot at getting their hands on power. A scientific debate, a public debate, a political debate can only be held in respect of facts and with an open mind. The art to disagree well is being lost in our democracies and is a threat to our, this loss would be a threat to our democracies. If the facts change, so should our, our theories and our opinions. If we lose our shared truths, then we lose the ability to have a peaceful, constructive debate. We beget fear and anger. We lose the potential for real progress. And ultimately, we will lose our freedoms. I strongly believe in the freedom of speech, but I also believe in standing up and speaking out against falsehoods and lies. And also, again, why cannot somebody you disagree with just be an adversary? Why do we need to make them our enemies? That is not how democracies should work. 
If you take away anything from what I'm saying here today, let it be this. The truth seldom lies in the middle. When there is near unanimity in the scientific community about the causes of climate change, should we then heed the few who refute these scientific conclusions and simply don't want to look up? Yes, we will make mistakes along the way of our green transition, but we will also learn and we will adapt our policies as facts change, as new insights are gained. We will be confronted with fiendishly difficult dilemmas, just as freedom and equality are principles most agree to, they are contrary to each other in absolute terms. Such is the complexity of life. The green transition is not a political left or right issue anymore. Most importantly, it's not to save the planet per se. The planet has been around for close to four billion years with you, without humans, and it will perfectly be fine uh, without us if we commit suicide. It will still turn around, it will still be there, it will change its, its nature, it's done so before. So when we act, we do this for the health, the well-being, for our children and grandchildren and th all those who come after us. Lest we forget, the young generations are homeschooling and masking up not for themselves. They're doing that for us, for their parents and grandparents. They have made incredible sacrifices in the last two years, and they're paying a price for that, a high price, and we should be grateful to them, and we owe it to them to pay it back, to not colonize their future with our uh, demands of today, but to be custodians of their future and to work with them on a better future. It is time we return the favor to them and plant the seeds for trees in the knowledge we will perhaps not sit in their shade of those trees, but our children will, and certainly our grandchildren will. Why can't we rekindle that sentiment our grandparents had after the war when they worked to build the country, knowing full well that they will, would not catch all the fruit, and their children would, and their grandchildren would? This is about your future, I say to the students. You will have to believe that you can shape it yourselves instead of becoming a hostage to history. And once you do, then imagine how you can concretely contribute to a better society for all. This transition is fully possible. It's not a technological challenge. It's not even a financial challenge. It is a societal, it's a political challenge. We cannot leave anybody behind. And this transition will work if we can prove to all of society nobody will be left behind. I promise you that we will continue to implement the Green Deal to convince other nations around the world to join us in this quest. And we will take your motto, Impact for a Better Society, with us as we do so. Delft University has been a trailblazer for 180 years. Delft University will continue to do that. You take your role in society so seriously. You do not bend to criticisms if you take a position on the issue of the climate crisis. You direct your students and your professors in the direction so that they will find the solutions for the challenges humanity face. And for that, I commend you, and I am deeply honored that would you, you would allow me to be part of your community. Thank you very much.
Write it, cut it, paste it, save it, load it, check it, quick, rewrite it, touch it, bring it, pay it, watch it, turn it, leave it, start format it, buy it, use it, break it, fix it, trash it, change it, no upgrade it, charge it, point it, zoom it, press it, snap it, work it, quick, erase it, write it, cut it, paste it, save it, load it, check it, quick, rewrite it, buy it, pay it, burn it, flip it, track it, drop it, zip it, and zip it, Technologic. Technologic. Mr. Timmermans, thank you very much for your extremely inspiring speech. And thanks also to the dancers, Evelien and Redouan. At TU Delft, it's our mission to use our knowledge and expertise to make the world a better place. We combine our past experiences with our boundless curiosity. And we use them to look ahead to a sustainable, carbon-neutral world that should come about in the next 30 to 50 years. But do we have to wait that long? At our university, we cover all the scientific bases from fundamental to applied. It's precisely this multidisciplinarity that makes us stand out. On the subject of energy alone, we've got over a thousand scientists involved. That's why on the occasion of our birthday, we thought with all that expertise in house, shouldn't we look at how we can speed things up a little. So we set up a dedicated energy transition accelerator team to do just that. Let's take a look. The accelerator team is a team of uh, university energy researchers who meet together and share their science and vision to accelerate in a multidisciplinary approach the path towards net zero and to make the energy uh, transition happen faster. Creative, very diverse uh, group of uh, people with attitude, an attitude toward making things better, basically save the planet in the end by changing the way how we deal with energy. It's very carbon intensive, uh, resource intensive, inefficient and uh, we as engineers we think we can do better. We think that if we come together and share our insights on our specific uh, uh, scientific backgrounds that we can actually uh, accelerate the energy transition and that we have a, a kind of synergy um, uh, so that we can do more as a team than we could have done individually. A fantastic uh, platform to uh, discuss with my colleagues the uh, uh, incredible uh, uh, achievements that we've got so far, 
but also to strategize for uh, uh, next couple of years uh, how TUDEFT can play a major role in energy transition. You have lots of preconceptions about other technologies, I think, and I think the, the, the Accelerator team gives a chance to, uh, uh, to talk through those and find what, what, where you're wrong, where you're right, and, and, and yeah, how to, how to move forward. We, we need to know more about why people do things to accelerate the energy transition. We don't get there with technology or money alone. Well, we see possibilities to, to speed things up, to educate people uh, better. It can be our students, but also maybe people from industry or uh, policy makers. Uh, and in that way, trying to influence. Well, we are a group of people very convinced that we can do something, that we can change things, that, that our collective effort will matter. I think that is a, a, an internal, maybe, you know, idealistic way that we work together and we join forces um, where the change is going to be big, which we hope or small, uh, that it will matter. And we are convinced about that. And therefore, we are willing to put our time and our effort and, uh, on this, on believing that we can, we can make a difference. We talk about the energy transition, but when you really break it down, there are actually three transitions inside. We summarize these in our formula for speeding up the energy transition. And that is decrease energy and material consumption, plus digitize energy systems, plus decarbonize society. And it's not a matter of doing one of the three, we need all three to make change happen. You know, the energy transition will take for a quite large part in the built environment, eh? so it's a lot about, about buildings. And uh, of course we can uh, change the uh, energy supply, we can all use PV cells and uh, windmills, uh, but still it doesn't mean that that will work well in buildings because it also uh, changes the comfort and the systems inside buildings, so we have to make buildings ready for this energy transition. Together with the current energy transition, we also need a transition in technologies. And the biggest challenges are to convert CO2 into useful products and to separate these, these products from mixed streams. And that is where we are working on. Yeah, digitalization is very important because um, we need to create models of the energy system to see how the system behaves when we change certain parameters. It will make things more reliable, uh, more flexible, uh, more efficient. This is what usually happens when you digitize a certain sector. This happens with automotive and avionics and uh, industry and so forth. We now have it in the energy sector as well, and we have the same expectations. The digital transformation of the energy sector will tear down barriers. When you imagine the energy transition, I think most people think of electricity. Most people think of light bulbs or windmills. But actually, heat is around 50% of our final energy use, and that's about 40% of the CO2 emissions. But when we come into the urban environment, it can go up to about 80% of our energy use. With the North Sea platform that we have for harvesting wind of this North Europe together, uh, intertwined and integrated with the sun, solar energy that we can mostly also utilize from the South Europe, and scaling up the storage technology, we can provide large scale energy, clean energy to the European energy market. And so with that, we can decarbonize energy hungry industry with hydrogen quite feasibly compared to electricity. I believe that uh, green hydrogen produced from renewable electricity and water can play a very big role in the energy transition. It can be used as a, as a fuel, but also it can be used as a, as a starting chemical for, for many industrial processes. And in such a way we can, we can electrify or also, uh, also decarbonize some of the, uh, or defossilize some of the, the industry processes that are happening today. We embrace complexity and we try to modify systems, recognizing that they are composed of many parts which are interlinked and we need to study the elements and the parts and the relations. TU Delft is uniquely positioned to speed up the energy transition. We have a wide range of technolo technology expertise at our campus and not just that, we also have the expertise to design sustainable products, buildings and policies. We work on all levels from molecules to systems, from labs to real-life demonstrators um, 
And we also realize that we can't do it by ourselves, right? We have to work together with industry and with government. What we see on a Tier Delft scale, we also see really in this accelerator team. That multidisciplinary drive, the realization that all those challenges are intertwined and we need a holistic approach. And if you combine that with the can-do mentality that Delft engineers are known for, I would say you know, we are convinced as a team that we can speed up the energy transition. We have, uh, we have ideas on the table of really opportunities that we want to accelerate. We should look at the energy transition with the, the eyes of our children. They are uh, always very excited about changes. I envision a society where we can implement technologies for making the energy transition possible, but also creating welfare for the whole world. So here we are, almost at the end of this celebration. At the beginning of another year, at the start of 180 days of speeding up the energy transition, and also at the start of the rest of our lives. What we do from now on is of the utmost importance. We've had so many wake-up calls recently that we can no longer pretend in any shape or form that climate change is not happening, and happening fast, faster than anyone expected. That means that many of the things we thought certain are crumbling beneath our feet. Indeed, keeping our feet dry is no longer a given. Just look at our flooding rivers in the province of Limburg last summer. Disease-bearing mosquitoes are found ever more frequently in our own and in our neighboring countries. Extreme weather conditions are occurring more frequently all around the globe. Wake up, people. It is in our backyards. Sure, you will say, but action is being taken, isn't it? Yes, but it's, it is not going fast enough. Despite the fact that scientists all over the globe have been warning for decades that we must go CO2 free. We must go circular, curb our consumption of goods and resources. It hasn't happened yet. So now we have to face up to extreme heats, droughts, smog, insect plagues, migration of flora and fauna, salination of agricultural land, sea level rises and worse. But do I despair? I don't. Because what we do at TU Delft, research, innovation, education, we are more relevant than ever. Yes, we are late, but we can still make a difference. Because Prometheus means forethought, or thinking ahead. That's what we do. We look and think ahead and act accordingly. We are proud of our heritage of 180 years and we owe it to that heritage to demonstrate leadership. We do this today by increasing our efforts in speeding up the energy transition. It's an inclusive effort. If we are to stand a fair chance to limit climate change, we cannot rule anything out, nor can we do it alone. That's why we stress that all forms of emission-free energy, including nuclear energy, must be investigated for their potential role in the energy transition. And that's why I also call on you today. At TU Delft, we show our commitment to the energy transition for research, education, and together with our partners, innovation. We will continue to make people aware of the fact that we have to accelerate these efforts. We will also make the scope of the challenge more tangible to create understanding and awareness. And today, I reach out to you, colleagues, students, alumni, startups, stakeholders, and all of you who form part of our wider TU Delft community. You are needed more than ever. Let's speed up the energy transition together. Well spoken, Tim. Thank you, Prometheus, thank you. Now, may I ask you a question? Of course, go ahead. Back then, when you took the fire, how did that make you feel? It was great. I, I felt like a rebel 
but one with a very good cause. I wanted to make an impact, to make the world a better place, but the world belonged to human beings. So I made sure they got fire, to ignite the spark of their curiosity and to light their way to new skills and knowledge. How about you? That's just how I feel. Well, apart from the rebel bit, I feel responsible for and, and proud of the impact we've had in the past, for where we stand in the present, and also for what we're going to achieve in the future. You may know this, but as a university, we want to create impact for a better society. That's our mission. And to make that happen, we have to take that flame you gave us, that fire that burns within us, and pass it on to next generations. Because that flame symbolizes knowledge, innovation, creativity, and ambition, and our passion. It is a mentality you can see all around our campus and our entire community. And the world needs it because we have big challenges ahead of us. Ah, my flame and my heritage are certainly safe here in Delft. It is. But may I now ask your help? Let's pass on your flame together. Because for the next 180 days, we are enlisting our students' help with the energy transition during their very own energy challenge. It would be my pleasure. <coughs> Dear students, I hereby pass to you my flame and my fire to take up, I implore you to take up this energy challenge and make sure my flame will keep burning even without fossil fuels. May you feel inspired to help speed up with this energy transition. Thank you, Prometheus. It was a great honor to meet you in person. Likewise. A birthday calls for a treat. Impact is our birthday treat. It is our gift to society. We fully commit to making a difference. So, for the next 180 days, let us celebrate our active role in the engineering transition together. And let's hope that you can all visit the campus again in the coming months to help innovation grow. We hereby declare the anniversary celebration officially open. <laughs>